I'm Tom DeLacy, Director of Spanish American Football Academy here in New York City. You are watching Field of Dreams on ACTN. Forza! everybody, welcome to another edition of Field of Dreams on ACTN. I'm Steve David, I'm your host. Um, today I want to talk about uh, food preparation, football preparation beyond physical. Let me introduce my panel, who is going to help me do that. Um, Narada Wilson, welcome to Zed Narada. Yes, yeah, so well it's a pleasure to be here Steve, and good topic, especially in this time where some of the physical, you know, parts of football have been slightly limited. So we have to see what else our athletes or footballers would have to be doing to work on their game. And next in the rider is Larry Joseph. Welcome to said Larry. Thanks again, Steve. Always a pleasure. You look sharp with your, your nice um, red and shoes and matching. You always do that, man. Don't I? You are well I dressed. I hope I'm not mistaken for some political appointee. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I hope it doesn't represent po any political <laughs> affiliation. Um, guys, I've been thinking, um, let me start with, I didn't realize how much psychological preparation in football, how important it was until in 1973 when we were preparing for that event in Haiti. And we had a woman called Sh Shirley Rudd Otley. She did not get enough credit for the work that she's done for that squad. So I want to pick up on this phase of uh, our talk, which is psychological, but um, if there is any person that you guys want to pick up as well, feel free to do that. But she played such a big part in our preparation and I would take you guys, as we, as we talk, I would take you guys through some of the things that she has done for us. And so she knows that we appreciate it and we feel, I want to make sure I personally thank her for her efforts in, in what she's done. Have you done anything, uh, met any person in that regard? Yeah, um, for me, um, you know, presently, uh, at least in my time, the was the sport company has a psych, uh, sports psychology unit more or less and you know from my professional stance you know a lot of my clients have been fortunate enough to work under some of these persons and especially i would have to say uh, amanda johnson um, she's one of the psycho sports psychologists with the unit and she has worked with some of my clients you know obviously they maintain some confidentiality at times um, but who have gone through a lot of stressful you know incidents in their career, whether it be from, you know, not being selected on a national team, having to go to one of, you know, one of the big international tournaments, or probably some sort of mishap or occurrence that happened in their career, whether it be due to injury and stuff like that. And you get to realize, you know, because football is a livelihood or sports is a livelihood for a lot of these clients, yeah, their mental health is something that is very important and they get to realize that that sometimes because they can't do the physical anymore is the only thing that could get them through on a daily basis so i must say amanda johnson with the sports psychology unit and sports company and the others but who in particular i uh, know for me uh, there was no psychological help um, on a team or personal level during my playing career uh, the closest uh, we came to, or I came to, was either an employee of the company or somebody who the coach would bring in to kind of give some pep talk. 
right. but nothing in the capacity as what we know today, having a qualified sports psychologist come in and deal specifically with the psychological impact of the game and, and all that sort of stuff. So I was never exposed to it at that level during my playing days. Well, and, and you, you know, we didn't do it back in the day either. We didn't even have coaches at, at a local level back in the day. But when this woman walk in, I'll give you guys what happened. When this woman walk into camp, the TTFA and the Brit, so what are they bringing a psychologist for? What do we need that for, you know? Mm. We just need to be able to run and, and, and play football. But she walked in camp. Well, good-looking lady, so she was accepted one time. Easy on the thing, everybody thing. And so she walked in and she got the acceptance and she got our attention. And then she, Shirley Rod at least, introduced herself. And then she says, here yeah, what? We need to come up with a chant and we need to make this um, we need to do it together. So we, you know, everybody's throwing out all kind of little <laughs> bits and pieces. And she's taking from everybody and she started to build this chant. Okay? The chant, um, she says, it has, let's, let's, let's start with you first. So, you know, and so we come up with, or eventually end up with, I'm, I'm short circuiting this. I'm the greatest because you have to get the, the power, the feeling, right? I'm the greatest. And then the second part of that chant was team one, we are the best. So you see, so it, this took us about an hour to get I'm the greatest, yeah. and about another hour, uh, different people think we are the best. And then the third part of the chant was and we were saying that like, we already won. She said, no, 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 that is not Trini. We done win. <laughs> so we go, I'm the greatest. We are the best. We done win. And then she said, what next? Munich next. Munich was where the World Cup was going to oh, be. Right. So before every game, we would say, I'm the greatest. We are the best. We done win. Munich next. And we feel like we're ready. And this is how she pump us up eh? She said, no, you can run through a brick wall if they put a brick wall there. So she pumped us up that much. So every time we, we chant, I'm, I'm saying it now and I'm feeling it, you feel it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you feel like you could really run through a brick wall. But she also prepared us for defeat. So when we, if we lost the game, or which, which we did lose, yeah, you know, it's forgotten. We, uh, we, it's forgotten, and we will talk about that some more. I don't want to over talk my <laughs> little thing, my thing, but but she was so good. And Shirley Rod Adley, if you are around and you still, I thank you so much because she did. You did so much for my psyche, my psyche playing football. Um, I will have to agree, you know, um, I think some of the things that she did there was sort of like a self-reassurance first, a kind of collective reassurance, and then, you know, maybe a mission and all that. So she prepared you all really well for different parts of what contributes to the game, you know, the overall mission of the team. And I think that is something the psychologists are able to do. I think what happens is that they tend to work with a collective group, but finding a way to bring out individual problems, worries, and stuff like that, and kind of put it out without targeting a particular <coughs> person. Because a lot of times when I played football, you know, whether it was at university or club level here, there were things that were going through your mind or even personal things you were feeling, whether at home, your nerves or whatever. <coughs> but I guess football being somewhat of a macho sport, if we want to say, it, mm -hmm. you know, you, you weren't going to say those things. Everybody puts up a front, but you have your personal issues that you're dealing with and I think when they come in and you have your one-on-ones -on with them you're able to put it out there and then they could now find a way to present it to the entire team you know anyone feeling this or this is normal until now people get to realize how much that stress you know plays on a career and I, we were, I was watching recently one of you know those docu-series with you know Michael Jordan and they were saying something like you said with they even prepared you for the failure where they said that some things you know once you accomplished it, they kind of, I think they burn the paper after they put their mission, burn it and forgot it because the next year 
is a new mission or the right. next game is a new game. So you can't dwell too much on the success, just as you shouldn't dwell too much on the failures because, you know, you always get up and go again, which is the fortunate thing with football or in sport, that you always have another match or another goal, and that's what they get you prepared for. And, and, and you know, um, they always come up with a chant. And, and I'm, I'm talking because I want <laughs> coaches out there to know, and I want kids to know. Yeah. They always come up with a chant. And the chant is the pilot. That is what rev you up at that point before you go out in the game. Yeah. Just like the Bulls had a little chant, yeah. um, what time it is, yeah. and they rev them up. I think the psychologists do that. They give you a chant. So now it brings you right back into the room yeah. where they really develop. Yeah. Um, they, well, 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 not develop, where they psych you out. Yeah. And, they, and they, 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 they rev you up to run through some brick wall. So psych, that's when I realized psychology is really big in, in football because it changed your mindset. And, and now you, you're ready to play. Because when after we chant, now we're ready to play. We, we like this. We focus. We in the game. It's like an actor in his role to to perform. So you you, you could be whoever you want, right? So, uh, but she didn't go with us. Shirley Rodley did not go to Haiti with us. But she was there. Yeah. You know, every time we chant, she was there. And, 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 and every time we run out in the, after we say, oh, we're trying to run out in the field, we, we are in, we are, we are in the zone, yeah. mm -hmm. we're in the bubble. Mm -hmm. And so that's when I realized how important, you know, psychology is in football, but, but I took it to my entire career. I'm the greatest, I always, we are the best. We don't, well, I didn't go with the part we don't yeah, win yeah. Munich next, but I'm the greatest. And I, well, we are going to be best. That was my personal. And I always felt, I remember one day, I was in, in LA, I was living across from a movie theater, and I go see the, this movie, Muhammad Ali, I'm the Greatest, I'm the greatest yeah. with the, that song and everything. And anytime I'm in the tough times, man, doing if we're training and they say all right we got to do 10 shuttles in 10 seconds and and 30 minutes rest and that song used to be the one that keep me driving me through all the hard work we're running the the horse track and while we were on the horse track hollywood park horse track running in that sand that dead sand i am singing that little song in my mind chanting because I was, I mean, I used to like to train, but I didn't really like to train, <laughs> but I used to do that. Yeah. But so I had to get something to pump me up to take me, take me through that. You know what I'm saying? So well, Larry, there had to be something that keeps you in the moment. What yeah, did, yeah, well, what of kept course, you and, and, and now that we're talking about it, I used to do my own personal psychology on myself. Right. Of course, because um, as, as I mentioned before, in those, those days we would expose professionally with right. an, uh, an individual to cover that area for you. So, uh, and I'm sure I'm not alone in this, in this thing. I mean, I used to, the night before games, you know, I used to sit and process the games in my mind, you know, what I would do when I get the first pass, how I would control it. If I had to, my first intervention would be a tackle, or I'd want to win the ball, or if it was to be a header, try to win the header, you know, and try to psychoanalyze the game yeah. in my mind to give me an added edge of preparedness for the game, right? So it, it helped me. It helped me in a lot of the games I found that I was able, before the whistle blew to start the game, I was already in the game. Yeah. And it, it helped me more, I found out, when I traveled abroad and had to play away from home, I found that my game became a lot easier for me because of that personal psychoanalyst, analyzing of the game. You know, um, I wonder now if I was exposed to you know, a professional and dealing with you team-wise and maybe individually, 
how much more I might have been able to, to tap into my potential. But I can see where the modern game has attached psychologists into their preparation because it plays such a fundamentally important part in the player's performance. And I think most professional teams now uh, has a, a, a psychological uh, attachment to it because it has become part and parcel of, of team preparation, you know. So uh, I'm just looking at my own 2% analytical preparation in a psychological way, and I'm seeing where it, it is very important for any sportsman in any sport. And, you know, I just want to give credit also <clears throat> in a sense that, remember, the, psych, the psychology of all of this is, you know, in the mind. And, you know, we, some, in some years we may not have had a professional psychologist, but if you had a proper family support, as well as even spiritual support, the fact that, you know, you might have been reading, um, you know, getting messages from above, you praying to God and all of that, I think that is also a type of psyche, you know, in getting you through games, because you will have been believing, whether it be scriptures, any readings, you know, things your family telling you, your support base, so it's always there, you know, something on your mind helping you towards a goal or preparing, you know, for any game play. So there's also that, you know. Yeah. yeah. And you speaking about spiritual, we're going to cover that in the next segment. But you're right. That is so important. When you spiritually grounded, man, it, it, it helps you with everything, right? But it, it, it don't let you cheat. It, um, it don't let you cheat in football. You, you come out, and you, you, you know, you have to look yourself in the mirror. Yeah. And 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 uh, like like, who said that? But I, I wonder if it's, it's Gally or somebody. But I heard somebody say one time. I remember all these things from way back here. Eh? They says, man, when I walk off the field, if I play shit. It's good shit, <laughs> you know. He says because because I gave it everything I had. Yeah. yeah. So um, you know, spiritual aspect is yeah. so important as well. You know, the psychologist does what the formal part of it is. It's just maybe if persons didn't have the support, the spirituality, at least there yeah. is another option or where someone comes, you know, neutrally and to ensure that that component is still there. The psycho psychological part is important in the game. You know, it's how you think, how you react, because we get to see it. We see that if somebody is not have in the right frame of mind, some basic things that you need for football seem yeah. to be complicated to do, and it has nothing to do with whether you're physically prepared or ready for the game. It's just that your mind is elsewhere on something else you're dealing with, or just not in the right place at the right time, and then execution seems to be at zero in performing any task. Yeah, right. Correct. I mean, that's one of the reasons why teams have a, a, a camp settings, yeah. so they could reduce the distractions for, for the players and as individuals, so they can now work on preparing uh, you as an individual and, and the team for the task ahead. Yeah. In order to do that, you need to control certain aspects of the preparation. Physical, spatial, psychological, you know. So, you know, we talk about it now, and back in the day, we didn't really have a huge appreciation for it. But now that we're looking back, mm -hmm. we can see the important part of play. Right. So let's pick up spiritual when we come back. Um, so we take a break. Viewers will be right back after this short break. The Prime Minister has called for a population to show compassion, humanity and common sense. Let's fight this together. This is Nikki Crosby and COVID-19 is no joke. The best thing you can do to bless the nation right now, Olya, is stay home. There's one enemy, which is the coronavirus. I know that it's real difficult to be inside all the time, but find different things to do. Stay away from crowds. Obey the law, basically, you know, just stay safe. I urge that you take care of yourselves and your loved ones. Wash your hands frequently and, of course, be wise and sanitize. Stay safe, stay indoors. Stay inside, practice social distancing. Stay home, stay safe, stop the spread of coronavirus. The battle right now for us to stop COVID-19 is for you to stay home and keep distance. I'm doing my part to flatten the curve, all right? We need you to do your part. Stay home, stay home, stay 
home. This was a production of the Ministry of Communications. ACTN, the voice, your family friendly station. Okay, welcome back, viewers. Okay, guys, um, before the break, we were talking about um, psychological importance, and now we shift a little bit to how, how you have to be spiritually grounded as well. So you, you know, you, you in that spiritual realm that you, you, you have somebody, you know, you know that you have to give your all. That's how I felt. And, and you have to look yourself in the mirror and you, and the people I noticed who are spiritually grounded are the disciplined guys. I always look around my teammates. And the ones who are spiritually grounded are the ones with the most discipline. Why? I'm, 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 be, I'm being like now, I'm being a, a host here now. Why? Why do you think that happens? <laughs> <laughs> well, Larry started. Well, um, it's a, I think it's a given when people uh, think of, of somebody as a spiritual person or a Christian. There's a certain standard that is expected of that person, especially back in our days. In our days, we... Our society was very conservative because right. of our religious beliefs. Correct. You know, our culture was guided upon church statutes and the Bible and that sort of thing. So there was no way you could turn, including sport, where those principles didn't play a huge part. So if, I mean, and I could speak of these things personally because I've been a born-again Christian for years. I mean. My own uh, football journey was, was started primarily at an early age, just when I, 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 I came to the Lord. And, and so, it, on a personal level, it guided my entire career. And as you said, uh, Steve, in terms of you expected these players to be well-disciplined and everything. And I can, and I can uh, agree with that sentiment because as much as I wanted to win, I never wanted to and never did want to win at all costs. I will not and did not cheat when I played. Right. It, it, it wasn't part of my makeup. It never even entered my mind to cheat while the game was going on. It was something foreign to my makeup, you know, and obviously it had everything to do with my uh, spiritual beliefs. And, uh, I want to say that it, it was a plus rather than a minus because I wanted to perform so well every time I hit the park because you wanted people to say, well, yes, you know, this person, this, this Christian person is not a liability to the team because of their belief and thing, right. but no, as a matter of fact, they're an asset, yeah. you know, and that's on the field. Off the field, I found that, that in the dressing rooms and in the training, a lot of my uh, fellow players would come to me and ask for advice or to bounce something off of me because of the person that I, that, that I was, you know. So one spirituality to me is a tremendous asset both to the player, to his teammates, and to the team. Well, I feel <clears throat> also, I feel um, like you said cheat. You know, you, you look around at your players, like if the coach says 10 sit-ups, and somebody do, and they're looking to see where the coach is. <laughs> and, and they, you know, and that is, but when, and when you go out to the game and you can't fulfill your requirement, or you, you know, you can't pick up your man, then you say, you know, the man tell you to do 10 push-ups, you do eight, you know? So all of this is part of the psyche, you know. Again, when you're spiritual, you're ready. In the head, you're ready. You, you, you go through walls like, like Shirley says. I mean, I am spiritually grounded. And the discipline on a spiritual person is there. And that's, I love to play with these type of players because the discipline. And if you have discipline, hey, you get up in the morning, to go and do your run, 
You go in the evening and train, you know, because you're grown, you're disciplined. Um, I think it also comes from, you know, just to touch on what you said about the cheating and all that, it comes from because when you're a spiritual, religious person, whatever the case is, it's a divine entity that is bigger than you, and an entity in most cases that you're not able to see. So just as you're saying, the guy who is cheating by doing eight instead of ten was worried about a physical being that yeah. is actually tangible in front of him that could see. But when you're spiritual or connected religiously, you're thinking about a higher power who is seeing that even when you cheat in front of the coach, that power is seeing. So you tend to, you answer to something bigger, bigger. than you. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you answer to something that is not, that you know is seeing everything that you're doing. So you kind of submit yourself more than the average Joe might because he's only worried about the worldly things. Um, yeah. And it, it tends to really be reflected, you know, um, from the training to the games to the honesty. And like you said, Steve, you know, I agree. I think for me, I was always about, you know, positivity with players. I never thought you needed to say negative things because they risk a 50-50 if the person reacts well or not. And somehow you found that those, were gr those people that were grounded spiritually, they were able to understand things a bit more. You know? yeah. Even if it's a conflict, you just expected that person to at least hear you out, even if it was a disagreement. Even then to come into the battle on the field with you, you just expected that person to understand it from a better angle opposed to a cheating or to damage yeah. the person. You expected that they would come in because they wanted the ball win situation more. And you know, just relying on your team. You really didn't want any liabilities and you always were sure that at least the people that were spiritually grounded would give you that support in anything from an honest standpoint. And you know, I, I, for me it's just that they submitted themselves to a higher power that did not need to be seen for them to act accordingly. And you know, and that's, that's what very, I thought. Very good point, Narada. Very good point. Couldn't have said it any better. And I, I think that is what should drive uh, spiritual people in, in all aspects yeah. of their life because of the fact that they know that there is a God who's looking at them and you just can't hide from God, you know, as much as some people may think they can. So in, 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 in football, if we just zero back into to our talk here in terms of foot, football, you knew that uh, because you didn't cheat in the training sessions, you, you try to do as much and as the best as you could, as put instructions, you know, it, it came naturally to you because that was your stance in life. Yeah. It, it meant then that you were able to transfer that honesty onto the field. You, you wouldn't deliberately look to, to cheat, you know, because it was not, is not part of your makeup. Yeah. You know, even though you had to run that 40 yards to recover, to get in a defensive position, you would do it. Yeah simply because you've trained yourself not to cheat, you know, that kind of thing. So um, for, it worked for me. I mean, having said so, I'm not, I don't want to make it sound like I was a total saint during the game because a lot of times I would react to referee's decision because it's a physical game that plays at a thousand miles per hour. And when you disagree with a referee's blow, especially against you, you would react. And I, you know, I think people will forgive that type of behavior, but. You wouldn't, my reaction wouldn't be one of profanity and all those, so, you know, it would just be a disagreement with a blow. And I, I suppose I'm in no, I'm in good company with that because I think every footballer mm -hmm. reacts whenever yeah. a re referee blows against them, you know. But even a spiritual person, even in, in your reaction, it does dictate how your reaction is as compared to somebody who is not, because we all know some people whose reaction is, you know, are, are way above board, you know. They would have their own reasons for that. But yes, being spiritually minded does contribute to a person's performance. And, and I'm hoping that it is a, in a positive light because, I mean, I have known some people who claim spirituality, but their performance is quite the opposite of what you should associate it with. Well, yeah. I also noticed as well that the spiritually grounded guys are more mild-mannered. They accept criticisms. They can share back and forth. They're not a loud mouth. And the ones less spiritual, and I'm not saying to all the loud mouth, eh? <laughs> the ones less spiritual is more a loud mouth type. And, and 
easily aggravated. Yes, correct. And, and, and all that kind of stuff. Correct. Yeah? That, that is so correct, Steve. Um, I think it has to do with your, your spiritual training, yeah. you know, because let's assume that the person who is spiritual, let's, let's use the word Christian for now, you know, you would you expect that a Christian would be somebody who would spend a lot of time praying, Correct. reading the Bible, and, you know, these are exercises that help you to keep your emotions in check because there are certain revelations in your prayer life and in reading the Bible that shows you, uh, you ain't all that you feel you really is, you know. Right. You know, you are just a finite person who is imperfect and you depend so much on God's help to do things just to be able to get up on mornings and to be alive and to be able to have the turn to go and train and play this game that you love so much. So it gives you the information that helps you to realize, hey, you have a role to play, play it, right? You are not God's gift to the game. You know, it has some people believe if, if they can't play the game, the game will disappear and, and that kind of thing, no. You know, it helps you to realize you are not God's gift to the game and you are actually a servant to the sport. And your answer to go, go to how you utilize your talent and your skill, you know. And so it, hum, well, it should humble you in such a way that you, you, you channel your energy into putting it into performances. Right. And yes, I agree with you. Most of the believers that I know and played with and against, I usually tend to be mild-mannered and a little more control of the emotions and that kind of thing. People who are approachable and that kind of thing. So yes, I don't know if there's a correlation, but when we talk about it now, I realize that those are attributes that you could really attach to spiritual people. Yeah. So for coaches now, um, Narada, you think if you're selecting players for your team, you would base it on all of these um, things that we're talking about, or, or you just look for the player who can ball, the baller? <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, at the end of the day, we, uh, you know, you're in a sport, you know, you're looking, you need talent. Um, but I think if a coach has, 20 guys who are not spiritual and just talented or just have talent, then obviously he's going to have to choose just based on raw talent. But I think if you have talented players and some of them come with added attributes as spiritual, spiritual. and anything else, then naturally, even without selection, I think leadership qualities mm -hmm. tend to show. And I think you, you, you're not going to want your most in, your talented, indisciplined player being the captain, because when he has to talk to a referee in any <laughs> confrontational situation, I don't think you want that person risking getting a yellow card or a red card for something he didn't even do, but because he reacted a particular way, he took it. So you probably would want you know, a spiritual person. You're kind of saying, okay, maybe a press conference, chances are if we lose, this person might <clears throat> just say some things that, you know, <laughs> unacceptable, or he might lead the team. He knows how to make sure if a player gets into any situation, how he deals with the other players on the other team or how he deals with even the referee and the officials. So I think natural selection kind of shows its head yeah, in really. players with those added bonus attributes. Yeah, I mean, I don't think anybody, any coach picked uh, his team based on um, whether somebody is a priest or not. It, it was done purely to whether he is a baller, yeah. you know, because the competitive instinct of everybody, coach foremost, is that um, the more talented you are, is, is the more he wanted you to play for his team. So I right. think it's just whether the players that were selected or are selected happens to be a spiritual person at the same time as being a good footballer. <laughs> you know? so in, my, in my days, it, we always had one or two other uh, believers on, on, on team so that I would have company uh, to be with, I wouldn't always be my, my myself or even if I was, it wasn't any big deal. I mean, I remember the first time I got called to the national team was, uh, was 18 or 19 years old. <laughs> I wouldn't call any names now, but when I got up to the training session, I, you know, young Christian, I, after the training session, I go in my bag and I take out my little gospel chuck and I went and give it around to the players and them and them and watch them. So, yeah. 
I come along the road in the car that had the other guys <laughs> and them, them man and them cussing words. You're a priest, so up to you, boy. You see that man who passes in that car overtaking me, they put your head out the window and cuss that man, you know. <laughs> it, you know, it was all done in, 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 yeah, in, yeah. in fun, you know, but I think, and later on, we became very, very good friends. My nickname at that time was Father. Some of them still call me that, you know. But it, it, it just speaks to the fact that your spirituality, your spirituality drove you and dictated how you reacted and regardless of the conditions or who, because here I am, a journey come lately, and I mean, I walked into this team in the training, established names in training at football. You know, I was, I wasn't overawed, you know. As a matter of fact, I consider it an honor for this little red man from South to be walking on the same grass with some of these great names. But my spirituality allowed me to fit in, you know, and try to blend in with the least amount of discomfort for somebody in my situation. Yeah. I, I mean, and just, and just talking about that, especially for the young ones listening, they should try to get themselves spiritually grounded at a young age. Because most of the times, too, if you look at teams, the person and doesn't necessarily mean the spiritual, but the person with a level head, always the captain of the team, mm -hmm. or the person who can can settle things down, say, and, you know, always. So, and most of the time, that person is not allowed. As just, that person is very spiritual to me. Yeah. All of my captains, you know, they they know God. Um, or most of them, they know God, and they kind of carry themselves in such a manner that something you look up to and you follow. And I think, you know, to add to that, it would be that, you know, you get to realize that, and we're using football, but the road of football, or in life in general, has a lot of ups and downs and tribulations. And what would happen with a leader, whether it be the coach of a team or captain, is that they have two options. You're basically going to experience everything life has to offer and yeah. then realize you were in control of next to none of it. <laughs> and it really was something higher to some extent. You could prepare how to mm -hmm. deal with it. And I think for younger kids, you know, who are watching it, get in line with it one time, even if you don't have it, because you just save yourself having to learn it just at a later stage yeah. because of what life taught you. Prepare yourself now. So you, you go through the trials and tribulations reading on it, expecting it to happen, knowing how to deal with it, having comfort in something higher than you, to take care of you through it. You just, yeah, it's just what you're saying, Steve. Look at all the captains. They're either very experienced when they became captains, or they were young with a very level head due to their spirituality or support. Yeah. Okay, well, let's take a break. But when we come back, I want us to talk about mental strength and and what it takes to be mentally strong to take you through a 90-minute game without giving it up. Viewers will be right back after this short break. The Prime Minister has called for a population to show compassion, humanity and common sense. Let's fight this together. This is Nikki Crosby and COVID-19 is no joke. The best thing you can do to bless the nation right now, Olya, is stay home. There's one enemy, which is the coronavirus. I know that it's real difficult to be inside all the time, but find different things to do. Stay away from crowds, obey the law, basically, you know, just stay safe. I urge that you take care of yourselves and your loved ones. Wash your hands frequently, and of course, be wise and sanitize. Stay safe. Stay indoors. Stay inside, practice social distancing. Stay home, stay safe, stop the spread of coronavirus. The battle right now for us to stop COVID-19 is for you to stay home and keep distance. I'm doing my part to flatten the curve, all right? We need you to do your part. Stay home, stay home, stay home. This was a production of the Ministry of Communications. ACTM, The Voice. Your family friendly station. Okay, well, welcome back, viewers. Um, 
Okay, guys, let's talk about, the, we ended up on, on shifting to mental strength. And for me as a player, um, and I always say Americans or the Englishmen, they are more mentally strong than us. And, and a lot of people say, no, 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 no. I find as, as a nation, when it's time to go over the top or give it a little more than it, that's when we, I always compare us like as Brazil. I say if Brazil was, Brazilians were mentally strong, Correct. Brazil would have won every World Cup. And, and I feel we do the same. For me, and I know when I'm playing, Sometimes I know I could get a, uh, go and get a ball in, but I said, you know what, let it run outside, man. Let me get a break. The only time I think I am totally 100% mentally strong when I play it, I could run as hard and be as tired as ever, and a ball get loose going to, for a goal, I'm all my tiredness go. <laughs> I go, I will go and get it. And when I score it, then I feel tired after. So that's when I, I'm mentally strong. And, and there's, you know, but you have to be mentally strong throughout to take yourself over the top. Or even in practice, when you, you work in and you do your last um, shuttle run and then you, you to do another one, they say, is it, that's what takes you a little further in your condition and, and all that. But mental toughness is our, I think, our biggest problem as a nation in footballers. How you feel? Um, well, I would say, you know, at the end of the day, the brain is a muscle, as they say, and you have to exercise it. So you have to find ways, how do you condition your brain to be, you know, working and strong, you know, for these situations. I agree. I think Trinidad is closer to Brazil than we are to maybe England and stuff. Um, for us, a lot of this passion in sport comes from an emotional place more than anything. And we tend to dip our heads a little before or a little earlier than some other countries. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with, for us, it's a, a lack of adversity. Mm -hmm. you, know, um, mm -hmm. you know, you watch the times when West Indies cricket may have been great and it was, you know, these young Caribbean, you know, whether we want to say black guys, coming and doing something to the colonizers, you know, damaging some of the high-ranking European countries or other Commonwealth countries. Um, so there was something challenging. Today, you know, we find our cricketers are multimillionaires, and maybe a lot of things came a little easier. It's faster to come now. Um, and it transcends the football as well, you know. Even in track and field today, you see, I think track and field, we have a little more fight in us. We mm -hmm. see the guys going because they want to beat America or they at least want to get away from Jamaica in some regards. Um, but in football, I think, you know, we kind of making the money, they're making the living, they're getting to go abroad regardless of where. So we've lost that sort of fight and wanting to work on proving to the country that we're great. And it has to come from an early age. I think, you know, we're glorifying a very young group, you know, and I think by all means it might fall on the secondary schools league where a great, you know, great level of football in terms of for exposure, a great opportunity for to be exposed. A lot of backing in terms of financially and a support base. But in terms of talent, a lot of these guys are being exposed to being considered great players and highlighted at too young of an age. You know, and I even see it where I said it on programs before, I, I still have a little reservation with some of these games that mean nothing being played at the National Stadium, because I think it should be an honor to have played in the National Stadium, maybe at a final level, cool. Mm -hmm. But you should be running through some of the little grass and the little sand mm -hmm. here and there to fight to actually realize that, you know, you're trying for something better. If you get everything too easy, I think mentally they're a little too, so you find players get ruffled very easily. If we, you know, already going to lose, they just give up. There's no that extra mile to go because they've just been exposed to too much too quickly. You know? Yeah, the mental, and we, we opened the show speaking about the psychological uh, aspect of, of the footballer's performance. And um, it, it, is, it is so important, you know, you know as, a, as a former, as a past player, you know, I'm realizing now where my psychological strength 
uh, serve me in a lot of occasions and also on the flip side where my lack of psychological or mental strength also let me down in terms of my performances in, in some games. So it just drives home the point where the mental makeup of the player is part and parcel of his performance. Uh, you cannot divide the both of them. You know, um, if you, and, and the mental development takes in all aspects yeah. of the preparation. It takes in uh, what you do the day before, how you react in training, what is your interaction with your, your teammates, uh, your coaching staff, you know, playing at home in certain conditions, playing away, different ground conditions, how do you react to criticisms, you know, these are all part of your mental development because it's a journey that you're on as a footballer and each aspect of that journey, each junction of that journey helps to develop you mentally or it could also cause you to become so mentally weak yeah. that you're no good for the rest of the journey because I know of quite a few players who with their feet were very talented but mentally weak and couldn't stand up to the rigors and demands of a game, mm -hmm. especially if they were not having a good one and the crowd got, got on you, you know. And so they fell at the wayside because they were not able to make that transition on a mental level, not on a, on, on, on a skill level. And I've seen in some of my performances where because of my mental strength, I was able to have really good performances. I was over the course of my career, I would have like a 75% rate of good performances as against 25, you know, at, at, at that kind of thing. And I would put it down to my ability to mentally both develop, create, maintain, and increase whenever necessary. And of, as I mentioned before, all of this mental strength is harnessed under extreme conditions. You know, as Narada was saying, we grew, I grew up playing in the road, then going on a football field with mud. It, it had no rules, men tackling you and want to break your foot. You got to get away from that. All of that is mental preparation that steals you in your mind so that for instance, I used to find it a lot easier mentally <clears throat> to play away from Trinidad because the pressures of the home world wasn't on me that much. The crowd, as far as I'm concerned, was very neutral. Yeah. So I felt a lot freer. And so my performances were a lot, it, it, it reflected that. Yeah. When I was home, if you, if you had a bad game, you know your supporters would come down on you. And your desire to please your supporters was so high that you sometimes, if you don't catch yourself, you, you would listen to the noises on the outside and it affects your performance on, on, on the field. But mental strength is so, so important. And even though you might see some real skillful players and you might feel that they did it all with their feet only, if you were to really sit and chat with them, you realize that they were mentally tough. Yeah. And so they were able to drown out the noises, as the case may be, and all the distractions, and just channel their energies and their skill to that 90 minutes on the park. And I feel like defenders are always, and I, again, looking, looking at it now, defenders are just more mentally tougher than strikers. Why? Because they are in the position, if we miss, yeah. it's goal. And strikers, if we miss, we're going to do it again. I'm going to get another opportunity. But, and when we work, I mean, okay. If they say do eight laps, in your first lap, you, you're mentally strong because you know you have seven more to go. Yeah. But when you're coming down to the seventh, the sixth and seventh lap, you start to fade in the mind. And so we, uh, it's just natural for that to happen. We just want to get to the finish line. Yeah. So how we, how we build that? I say, if the coach says do 10 push-ups, you put in your mind, I'm doing 20. So you're going to be on the line. And, and we always say, 
to improve, you had to take yourself to the brink, mm -hmm. uh, collapse, and then do another yard or two, and then you could improve. And then the next time you go to that, and then you do another yard or two. This is to put that in the brain and, and, and digest it is very difficult. Yeah, um, I think one, that's one of, to me, that's one of the differences now between when I used to play and back in your days, Steve, uh, as <clears> against <throat> the modern player, you know, and this is just my assessment of it. I think the fact that we had such a passion for the game that it drove us both mentally and physically to want to excel and to be the best, you know, and the, the level of competition on a local level was so high that it turned out that you always improved both in your performance and your mental capacity because you were challenged on those two levels every time you went onto the park, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and it was something that you had to kind of self-evaluate because as we mentioned before, we didn't have all these different support systems back in the day. Correct. It's just you and the coach if you did have a coach at that time. So you find that your individual, not performance, but progression and improvement and potential was harnessed under these tough conditions and it redounded to the benefit of your improved performance and also your improved mental strength, you know. And at today's play, I find, because of all that they have around them in terms of the technology and, and all that kind of support and thing, I, I think that it doesn't redound to the mental challenges that we had to undergo before. And so there, there's, there's a deficit in that area. And even on the, on the, the talent level, <coughs> because the, the competition is not as tough as it should be. And of course, the only way you could improve is if you play against people who are better than you on a regular basis. Yeah. Uh, because if you, in a mediocre level, better than the rest, you will never improve. And I think that's one of the problems that I'm having with what, what used to give in, in our day as to what gives today. You know? uh, I think it's also, um, us as fans also are responsible for some of the shortcomings mentally for our players, if I look at it. Um, you know, you kind of hear you guys speak about an era where locally it was so hard to whether please the community, please the country. So you find like you all had to do a little extra work, whether you figured it out on your own or whatever, to get that respect. Today, I think we as the fans, we have sort of kept looking outside and not valuing our own. So we tend to kind of think, you know, we're just not going to, we're not expecting the kids to be at the stage that we have access to today which then leads us to not really criticize or demand too much from them. You know, we see anybody say they're good, we just like, okay. So these kids not growing up with um, a, a real sense of, you know, what they need to overcome in the future. Right, um, and you know, just to end that, because I want to talk a few minutes uh, on Sedley Joseph, is that I always look at the op opponent's strikers, and if they get in my defense trouble, I have to give their defense trouble. <laughs> so that, is my, that was my try. <laughs> Always. All right. Um, you know, you guys are aware the passing of Sedley Joseph, our captain, and they call him Skipper because he has run, um, you know, he has been captain for Trinidad team for a while, and he was one of, he, feel, he might go down as the best captain we ever had. Because that's how some people um, label him. And it's very sad to hear about his passing. And um, so I wanted to do a show on him, but um, if we can, we will get it done. But if not, um, what have you heard about him? If you guys have heard anything, and, and, and I have I seen him play, I played against him, um, not in national team. I was in the national team then, but as a kid, I saw him play and I played against him when he got older and he was a tremendous player. Yeah. Um, well, yeah. I will go because I know I'm kind of brief with it. Um, I wasn't able to see him play. Um, I worked around guys when I first started uh, coaching in, for a year. I worked around a lot of guys who played with him. Um, and, you know, we had the untimely passing as well uh, with Reginald George last year. So you kind of see that an era of captains, you know, because these guys 
held captaincy for a very long period in Trinidad, mm -hmm. very well respected, just as you said. I know Georgie was captain too and skipper and, you know, Sedley was the one that more people, you know, a lot of people considered him to be the best. Very respectful, intimidating at the time. There's a few words that I've held, um, seen and I went to a couple of the Malvern Maple games when they would have these celebrations and he would be there. So that was my interaction with him. Very, you know, well-mannered, humble guy who has done a lot for Trinidad and Tobago football over the years, and he received whatever accolades he had to receive, national um, medals locally. Um, and it is really untimely, and I hope he rests in peace and would be a part of the story of football that we've lost. Mm -hmm. Well, my first uh, contact with Sidley was uh, actually playing against BWIA graduates when Trinidad, we would be in camp, and they would bring these guys to give us a little practice, and I remember. <laughs> When we first saw them and we realized, well, they could bring these old men to play against me. <laughs> and when the game started, they realized why they brought them, because the teachers are a little less and to put a little dent in with pride and cockiness now. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Because them old men had we chasing shadows. Yeah. I mean, and I'm talking about 11 national players on yeah. the park. Right. And them old men and them is one touch and two touch. Yeah. And, and I'm on the field and I'm like, I dreaming. Can't get close to these men at all. Yeah. You know, it, it it blew me away. Uh, the next time I met Sedley, he was actually the manager of the national team when we went to first Gold Cup. I think he was the manager, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. I think he was the manager also for the Caribbean Cup Caribbean tournament Cup, that yeah. got us to the Gold Cup. Yeah. You know, so that's when I met him at his uh, administrative level, and of. Of course, I mean, I had heard about this, this Sedley Joseph, and, you know, his reputation went before him. Uh, the first thing that struck me when, it, when he was introduced to the team as the manager is how very cool and mild-mannered he was, mm -hmm. but there was a, a certain amount of respect that you gave to him. I don't know what to, to call it, but... He never lifted his voice in anger while he spoke. He, he, he just gave instructions as to what he wanted from the players. And somehow the way he said it, you, just you knew you had to do. And for that brief stint as a manager of the national team while I was there, Sedley was a total gentleman who I had total respect for, you know, and I would surely miss him. Rest in everlasting peace, Sedley. Um, Hey, thank you guys for being here. I appreciate you. Uh, ACTN, thanks for giving us the opportunity. Uh, we do have a Facebook page. You can check us out. We do have an email address, pwtt at gmail.com. You can drop us a line. Um, the show is ended. Go in peace. My name is Steve David. Good night.